All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today I have Scott and Jenny Graham. They are entrepreneurs, authors, speakers. They do everything. And they have this amazing, I don't know if I should call it a foundation, a community, a group. It's called Care Frontations. Does that, did I say it right? And we're going to talk all about this organization and the amazing work that they are doing all over the place. So welcome to the podcast, guys. How are you? Thank you, Keisha. We're doing great. Thank you. So appreciate you having us. No problem. I'm excited to talk about your work. So the first thing I want to ask is how did you two meet? (laughs) <laughs> that's, a, that's a loaded question that is such a loaded question it's really it's, it's really the uh it's kind of the corner foundation to, the cornerstone yeah to, of our of our amazing life so so jenny she and i met in the middle of my mess uh, i'm an ex la county sheriff's deputy and i had um imploded i was working undercover in vice narcotics out of west hollywood and i um did things that I wasn't supposed to do. And it was really just to support um, a habit that turned into an addiction that just made a mess out of my career, out of me. And Jenny met me at that downtime. And luckily for me- So I do want to point out, (laughs) so I met you, I I wouldn't call it your downtime, but I would call it the middle of the drama because he had already made ABC, NBC, CBS, one night when he was arrested while on duty. Um, And so because of what an ordeal all that was, the media was just in a frenzy. And so the legal team wanted to get it out of the limelight. Mm -hmm. So they were just postponing, no, not postponing, continuing, doing continuances. So although you were arrested in 85, uh, we didn't meet until the spring of 86. So eight months into his court case, We meet on a sunny day in an outdoor restaurant on the patio, like at tables next to each other, like just this fluke meeting. Happenstance, yeah. Happenstance, right. And so we met and struck up a conversation, and we were married less than three weeks later. Are you kidding me? (laughs) And that was 35 years ago this spring. Wow. Mm -hmm. Three weeks? But how did you know that he was the right one? (laughs) I, I keep asking her that 35 years later how did you know because I'm a woman of faith and I had the clarity and the mindset where I felt like I knew what I was waiting for and so while waiting for three and a half almost four years the clarity of that just got clearer and more clear to me and so the day that I met him I asked him several questions that were sort of my you know grid and he answered them all correctly. And so that meant that I was willing to go out for coffee and yeah, see him again. And so. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Was that your first marriage? No, I, oh. I, I married very young, was married very briefly. You were married before as well, mm-hmm. which made him a package deal. He came with two small, beautiful children, a little girl and a little boy. And I had wanted to marry a man that had a couple of kids, ideally a, a son and a daughter. And then that way I wouldn't have any pressure because I was really not clear about having kids at that point. Oh, that's so smart though. Yeah. So Scott, how did you know that Jenny was the right one? Did you just say, I'm just going to go with this or. No, I'll tell you what I I can say, you know, it was more of a visceral kind of a thing. She still is gorgeous and the full package on the outside, but on the inside, I had always desired to, um, you know, to not be with a quote unquote kind of a bad girl. I wanted to be, be with a, you know, a, a good girl, a smart know, girl. <laughs> someone, someone who had morals and ethics, integrity, someone who, you know, was willing to be independent and, and, you know, work and, you know, just, you know, just be that person that, um, that I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always knew what I wanted to be, but it's that, you know, I just, for whatever reason at that point in time, didn't have what what I needed to to be the full package and Jenny absolutely inspired me from day one and still does to this day uh to you know to to walk in integrity meaning like when no one's looking am I doing the right thing and so that's she's my inspiration for sure 
So Jenny, when you met Scott, do you remember what you were passionate about at that stage in your life? Oh my gosh, I was very passionate about the Lord. I'm a Christian, so my faith was the first foundational thing that just spread into everything that I was about. And still to this day, that's true. And I was super passionate about fitness, which we instantly had in common. You, you had that going too. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just passionate about people. So I think a lot of people are self-absorbed or distracted or whatever, but I had my eyes wide open, always looking around and seeing what divine interventions were just always right there within all of us, mm -hmm. all of us within our reach. Mm -hmm. So I was passionate then that we're powerful, that we're influential, that we're impacting. And I think so much of the world has checked out and wants to be, not wants to be, but has branded themselves as powerless as helpless and so just just that heart right to 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 lift people up yeah okay Scott do you remember what you were passionate about when you and Jenny met yeah uh I was passionate about family you know I had two small kids so I was a I was a passionate father and because my the privilege to parent my two kids on a daily basis was literally pulled up from underneath my feet uh, I was also a, a wounded, passionate man. Uh, like Jenny, I was, I had a very strong faith, really a childlike faith. And so even in the midst of all that trauma and drama that was going on, I, I never lost that belief, that faith that, that it was going to work its way out. So I, I, you know, wasn't fatalistic or catastrophic in my thinking, which really, I think helped me get through all of that. And uh, like Jenny, you know, I was definitely a people person. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy being around people. It's important to me. And I think that's why, you know, we moved into this in arena. Into doing what we do. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, family is really important to me. Okay. So when you guys met, um, Scott was going through some stuff. Um, how did you guys work through that? Oh, I just went undercover. Mm. It was so funny <laughs> I say that because he was an undercover vice narcotics, like that whole, like all the television shows and movies, like they make that up off of real stuff that was really happening to someone like him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I went undercover and then I thought, okay, this is risky. He's facing six to eight years in prison. He says he has the best attorney in Los Angeles. I don't believe that. Or Actually, if, it's, I did. if it's true... <laughs> What I didn't believe was that this, this attorneys have never lost a case representing a first responder streak, running streak was going to hold because I felt like, no, this is going to go down. Like Scott's going to go and he's going to serve some time. And so um, where was I going with that? How we got through it. Yeah. Oh, we went undercover. Mm -hmm. So I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell work. I, you know, I just kept it a secret mm -hmm. and, and that's, part of why we're passionate today about helping people like don't hide don't be undercover don't be ashamed don't isolate but at that time I hadn't had all these revelations so that's exactly what I did well, and I compartmentalized my life the way men are famous of compartmentalizing portions of their life like that's exactly what I did like mm -hmm. this is a secret and so well yeah. but you know what's interesting is is Jenny's, Jenny's family was very um, they weren't as outgoing as my family. My family's like that, you know, big fat Greek wedding the, the, on, on the, you know, on the extreme, on the extreme side <laughs> where she's very, you know, introverted and, and she's not, but, not her, introverted. But, her, but her family was. So it wasn't, she didn't have the freedom to, you know, speak what was going on where my family knew everything from the moment I started going off the rails, they knew it. And, and they just felt like I was going to work my way through that part. I didn't. And I mean, everything was exposed on my end. So that was a real freedom and probably good for you too, to be able to know at least oh, you know, yeah. family members knew what Absolutely. was going on as a support. I fell in love with your family from day one and counted your sister, my sister, your brother, my brother, your mother, your father, all, everyone, the whole package. Yeah, she dove um, in. Dove in. And, and so- Fully. And it, so that was a relief. But then to fast forward, you know, how we got through it to, to this side is we both had the same kind of download. And that was, instead of fighting the case, 
we felt like the right thing to do was to plead guilty to what I had done. With no evidence. It was all right. circumstantial. Right. And, and that's why my attorney really believed and he probably could have gotten me off. And, uh, but we felt to, to get through this, not have to look over our shoulder to again, walk with that integrity, we're, we're to do that. That and, higher standard. And that was scary because again, that means that I was relying on the mercy of the court to either get the low term, two years, the midterm, four years, or the high term, six years. And we went ahead and pled guilty and was- I love how you say we, even though- <laughs> Well, we went through it together. We really did. I mean- It's true. We did plead guilty. It's like, you know, I, I might've been behind bars, but you, you married were- the whole person. What can I say? Wow. Yeah. So I didn't make any sense to two years. And, and that was a, a, a surreal moment that stayed surreal for the whole entire 13 months I ended up doing. Um, the, first, the first two weeks while I was in county getting processed, I was next to the cell of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. And so that's who Jenny saw countless times and I was next to. And I mean, the whole, the whole experience, we don't, have, we don't have enough time to go into all of it, but so much so where you know, a, a Hollywood Talk, producer has right. the movie rights to this story. Right. Talk about an oh hell no moment. <laughs> like, like this is not this is not happening. And then it was, and then it was like, so it's not going to take me down. Well, none so, of that makes sense from the from you meeting meeting right, Mary right. and and saying yes to the possibility of a pen pal, an incarcerated pen pal. Like that's what his prospects offered to me. Mm -hmm. oh. we, we got we got through it. I mean, we 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 did it one step at a time, one day at a time, one month at a time. One letter at a time, we wrote every day. Yeah, yeah. and uh, our, our, we have two boys together. She was six months pregnant when I went away. When and he was finally sentenced. So the first time I saw our son, our oldest son, Tim, who, who's now 34? No, 33. 33. Anyway, it was through a glass. <laughs> like you see, on t like you were talking on a glass like, through like, the phone. Like a piece of glass, mm -hmm. and you pick up the phone, and then your hands, you know, touch. At the glass, like that's how he met this little baby. Yeah, it was painful. It was mm -hmm. really, really painful. Mm -hmm. But but it was rich too, though. It's like so we've rich. learned that the, the deeper the valley, the higher the peak. Right. You know, and right. and and we know that there's peaks and valleys mm -hmm. in all of life. You never stay right. at the top nor at the bottom. It's a journey, and uh, that strengthened us in relationship wise. We fell in love through that time because I mean. You know, you can say we knew we were right for each other, but three weeks time, I mean, come on, how much can you really know about a person? And so we had nine months together before I went away. So we right. literally had, you know, that time to grow within our relationship, but still it, it, it the depth came when we were apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's such a great story, guys. I would totally watch that movie. <laughs> okay. Then we'll keep you posted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah do come back tell me what is coming out <laughs> all right so um what gave you guys the idea for carefrontations like how did that come about and when did you guys start working on that like tell me everything <laughs> it, was another, it was another god shot jenny was working in financial services at the time when i got out and started to do life again and I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got two kids, three kids now, and I've got to do something. And so I get my insurance license, which later got revoked because I didn't know you couldn't have a felony and have insurance license. So I'm, I'm prospecting. I'm at a car dealership and pretending like I'm looking at a car. And this you know, salesman comes up like they all do and starts talking to me. And, and like within seconds, I knew he knew nothing about cars. And I said, you haven't been doing this very long. What did you used to do? He said, oh, I was a cop out here. I was out in California, Port Wyneme. I worked undercover and, and it's like, really, I'm LA County Sheriff, me too. I said, why aren't you a cop anymore? He's like, well, I don't really say this. To, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I stole $35,000 of cocaine out of the evidence locker, lost my career, got five years probation, went to treatment, and I'm, this is what I'm doing now. It's like, oh my gosh, me too. Oh yeah. my God, like that is crazy. That yeah. is a cool hell no moment. Cool. Yeah. It's crazy. Cool. And so we, we formed a friendship and decided to form a business. And, uh, and he was already, he was, although he was selling cars, he was already doing intervention work. And that's we didn't like even know. Divine intervention at its best. It like, was absolutely. And we did not even know what the word intervention meant. And, and most people, although interventions were being done in the 60s and the 70s. Now, here we are at the end of the 80s. We meet John in 1988. 
yeah. that that we still had not heard of this concept because the whole world is under this cloud, this this misperception that someone has to get rock bottom before they should get help, before they'll say yes, before it will work. And that's wrong, wrong, and wrong because intervention interrupts early, like a divine intervention, and it lifts a person up when that was the last thing that was on their radar. So John was doing that, and he invited Scott, certainly out of the, sem the being sentimental and how cops always work in twos. It's like, oh, I'm lonely doing interventions. Come watch me do this, and it would be so fun, and we could tag team with good guy, bad guy, like good cop, bad cop. Right. And so shortly after they met, John invited him to do that one weekend. And he came home from this weekend saying, oh my gosh, I, I, I found my calling. This is what I want to do. This makes sense of my life and what we've been put through, what I've put us through and everything else. So literally within just a short period of time, he was enrolled at UCSB up in Santa Barbara, taking alcohol and drug coursework to become a counselor, et cetera. So it was meeting that gentleman. We hit the ground. We hit the ground running. It was, mm -hmm. you know, to, to do our work. It's you've got to build it. And so, obviously, day one, you're just beginning, and it's about developing relationships. People have to know you. They have to trust you, obviously. So, for the first 17 years of creating care confrontations back in in 1988, we worked in the in the treatment field as counselors. Worked in the school system as counselors. Had a private practice. Did a lot of speaking engagements, that kind of a thing, and then. After 17 years, we said, I think we can do this now and make it our sole focus, which is kind of scary because, you know, we wake up unemployed every day. We have no idea what we're going to do, where we're going to go, but we trust it because the phone does ring darn near every day. And every fifth to eighth phone call turns into an intervention. We do family work now. So we do the back end piece of reconciling families. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we do some counseling here and there, too. So we, you know, that's. It's been quite the ride. I can tell you it's, it's 33 it's, years. Carefrontations is 33 years old mm -hmm. come March. Yeah. So when you jumped into it, right. Okay. There's the connection for you with, you know, the guy who you met having kind of the same past that you had, and then you knowing about, you know, drug abuse or whatever like that. But when did you really realize that there was a real need for this with um, people well, I, I think I, I realized that when I was fresh out of the academy and working in a maximum security facility where I got to not only be like the, the, you know, the deputy guard kind of a thing, but I, I took my time to interview people. I talked to people. That's why the sheriff's department has you work in the jail before you go out in the streets. And so every single person that I talked to, every inmate that I talked to, it was a drug and alcohol and or mental health issue that drove them to their criminal behavior more than just like being deviant. I mean, that could be a part of it, but drug alcohol. And then of course I was, um, I was involved with, you know, smoking pot, drinking from 15 years old on and, and that turns into other things. So, you know, my era of, of, of social influence, it was so prevalent too. And of course, we found out very quickly that we are not going to be working ourselves out of a job. I mean, there are so many people who struggle. And, and, and just if you think of the word dysfunction instead of drug or alcohol or, or emotional or mental unrest. Uh, yeah, that, that there's just unrest. Dysfunction is yeah. rampant yeah. in our society. So because of my financial training in, in that arena, uh, helping people manage their money and build retirement accounts and remortgage their house and all those sorts of things. I was, I was all about running a business for these two guys. I'll take the phones. I'll run the books. I'll run the money. Don't ask me to go out there and help anybody. I'm not putting myself in harm's way. And so that was my mindset initially, mm -hmm. but we kept losing cases because they would be adamant that they wanted a female. So I joke that I was dragged into, you know, needing to also help when needed. Um, but I fell passionately in love with it right away. And I realized, oh my gosh, there's, there's so much that I bring to the table that these guys with muscles don't. And yeah. so I'm so happy that, that we saw the light and I became a counselor and so on and so forth. And I actually have had drug abuse eating disorder behavior, you know, different kinds of things in my own background where I really understand that person that doesn't want help, doesn't think they need help, that, that I could 
just like you, step into anyone's circle when they least expected it and, and, and maybe be able to draw them out and find that middle ground and hopefully be that bridge that day that they crossed over to get to the help that they needed. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what do you think makes your program different from most programs that are intervention programs? Yeah, it's a, I think it's a really good question because we do believe that we stand out to most everybody in this industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people who do intervention work are still doing it kind of old school, meaning they're stacking up evidence. They're like building a case to logically be able to present to the one in need to hopefully convince them from a logical standpoint to go get help. And from our belief system, it's like that person's going to feel like they're being called out. And, and we think, no, we, we want to do the opposite. We want to call them in. And so instead of highlighting what's wrong with them, we actually want to wake up what's right with them. Because people in dysfunction, they lose sight of who they are, and they're very focused on what they are. And what they are is not a very pretty picture. And then the kicker is, is that people in dysfunction think that everybody in their life sees them the way that they see themselves. And so here's our great opportunity to go, no, no, no. We know you think that because you're riding a bike, you're a bike, but you no, you're not. Let, let me let me let me show you who you are. And so this beautiful piece of the work is waking up mm -hmm. the, the, the beauty of this person. So the majority of the time, there's laughter, the oil of joy comes that uh, there can be these downright just hilarious moments. And we're not laughing at them. We're laughing with them. We're mm -hmm. reminding them. So these are the kinds of things that would otherwise be spoken at a memorial, at a funeral, um, at a retirement party where you have, uh, or roast, where you have one speaker that's hilarious and one that's very Sounder. sentimental, serious. And so the personalities of the people who gather, whether there's two of them or five of them, they're, they're coming to bring their, 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 their deep treasure, like, this is why I love you. So they separate out why they need help, because we think this, if what was wrong could have gotten them to go, it would have already done so. So why would we go in there and hammer what's wrong, mm. right? And then another thing that makes us unique is we're thinking very much from a clinical standpoint, because we know as therapists that when we were treating people like the ones that we intervene on, they're very hard to treat because they're in a pool of denial. They're, they're, they're not forthright right. and open. They want to get done quick, get back home. There's all these factors that go on. And so we want to give families a healthy voice. We, we have this beautiful system that helps them write these amazing letters from an outline that we provide. So they're, they're, they're letters that they write are like masterpieces. They're, they're just keepsakes forever. But also we're giving the treatment team information they otherwise would never get. So that way they can treat the person more effectively because they can really see and hear the family's voice and perspective on you know, what are the problematic areas of life. And then finally, we really work hard on our recovery protection component. We want to shore up all the things that tend to happen post-treatment. And we've done a pretty good job of it because we, we measure our long-term success, which to us is the true success, uh, by the lack of phone calls we get from families that we serve. Because we've had the same phone number for three decades. And so we do get a call. You helped me 25 years ago. You helped me, you know, this, this kind of a thing. And uh, they know they would pick that phone up in a heartbeat because we go in very deep water together. And uh, that bonds you outside of, outside of time and, mm -hmm. and literally forever. Yeah. So it's pretty, pretty special. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. So what would you say is the key ingredient for success during family recovery services? Uh, I think it's, it's for sure, it's definitely the power of, of love, a, a unified love. Unity is super important. Cooperation, unity, the love, the truth, for sure, that we're trying to help people uh, not only speak their truth, but never shrink back from it. And we're teaching them how to speak it in a way where it can be received. So it's not so much what people say that causes problems, it's how they say it. And so we're trying to teach them a new style of how to speak that truth because, you know, the old adage, it's very true. You know, truth will set you free and it does. And people too often are afraid to speak their truth because they, they're, they're, they compare what has happened, rejection, confrontation. And we're teaching them, no, you can, you can really be brutally honest and you won't have the confrontation as long as you own your perspective and own your feelings. And so therefore, if you follow this new style of communication, you therefore can you know, keep moving forward without any trepidation. 
Yeah. And because it's, I mean, all dysfunction, this is true. We're only going to be as sick as our secrets. Mm -hmm. So let's not have any secrets. And I want to chime in and just say that I think the greatest obstacle, the greatest, uh, the absolute thing that, that, that is going to stand between someone's real recovery, like lifelong recovery, and this goes for either the person that went off to get the help or the family who was affected by that, mm -hmm. uh, is bitterness. So bitterness and unforgiveness are just these big roadblocks. And unless they're faced either with help or divinely on your own, that these, these will not allow real recovery and the extent of what could have happened. Mm -hmm. And right after that bitterness and forgiveness piece would be the whole regret and shame piece. And so, so many people start in recovery and don't shake off the regret and they keep reliving the past and we just have right now and what's next and so if we could let our past inform our future and not define it or confine it or dictate it yeah yeah or dictate it mm -hmm. we'd have a different world yeah yeah absolutely and that's applying to someone with with any type of problem so not just you know a classic substance abuse problem yeah. That was the truth for all of us to hear. Mm -hmm. Do you guys think that families can heal past any type of trauma or family secrets? We've 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 experienced it. We have we've helped families walk through it. So yes, but it's too rare and too it's not talked about enough. Yeah, you know, well, and so there's a real low kind of expectation like that whole aim for the moon and maybe you'll miss and make a start versus aim for the ditch because I know I can make it. I, th I think that what prevents people from having true breakthrough and freedom in whatever traumatic experience they've had uh, is you know if you're still tethered to to it if you're still somehow tethered to it you're never going to have that breakthrough and so how do you get untethered? Well, you have to have a strategy. And I think too often people, well, time will heal. It's like, well, time will reduce the sting maybe, but, and, and, and even when you have breakthrough, it doesn't mean you forget. It just doesn't have the same impact on you. It's like post-traumatic stress disorder. It's like, the, I keep feeling the same emotion when something triggers that. Well, unless you work through it, you'll always feel that trigger from it. And that's why, you know, therapy and, and the willingness to want to change and grow, uh, I mean, if someone's motivated, they could read a, a, a book and, and develop strategies uh, on their own or with a friend and not necessarily need to go to a psychotherapist to, to, to do it. Not, not that they wouldn't, you know, but that it's amazing the different avenues that there's not just one road to that recovery. Acceptance to me is, is huge. Gratitude for literally the breath I'm breathing, uh, the opportunity that, that each day presents. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a mindset of, of, of that gratitude and hope and, um, and just learning, you know, from the past. Uh, sometimes we're never going to find the reason behind it on, on, you know, this side of heaven, as I say, you know, it's, it's we're just not going to know until we, get, until we get to the other side. But, but it's interesting that you ask that and it makes me think of uh, sometimes you see a family's legacy is attacked that, that the same story happens three generations back. It happened to my grandmother, it happened to my mother, and now it happens to me. And I feel like, you know, I've broken free of something where I'm, I'm speaking from experience and three generations and to finally be able to be the one that has that forgiveness, that walks in the freedom. It, it, was, th it was three times harder because I feel like I fought that fight for three generations of women. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's amazing what can happen if we would just take our eyes off our feet and look up. Yeah, absolutely. So um, tell us about your Intervention in a Box um, online course. Well, that was a, uh, a baby that was created because we, we were talking to so many people year in and year out who could not afford our services. And it was painful 
to, you know, just say, oh, we're so sorry that, we, you know, we just, we're not in a financial position where we could do this for, for free, essentially. And uh, so we just, and also too, we wanted to be able to create a, a kind of a legacy of, of the work that we, you know, that we do. And so for, what was it, about a two-year project? I, well, it was, it was, we were pregnant with the idea for a decade. Yeah. And then once we decided to start pushing, go into labor with it, yes, it was a solid two years before we ended up in the studio filming with a producer and all the camera and like everything. Writing the very, scripts, everything. Very professional and just egged on, you know, encouraged in our own soul, knowing that, you know, this is material that, that we've taught we would go as a guest speaker in a high school. We did this several years in a row and the, the students would write mock intervention letters to a character in a book that they were reading as a class. And that was safe for that environment because you wouldn't want to cut them open and leave them bleeding when their mother's really an alcoholic and this is like triggering some stuff. But we did that for several years in a row and these teens wrote the most amazing letters. And we've seen over the years, having children and teens involved in our interventions, how they just get it. They get it right away. They're used to an assignment and outline instructions and this and this. And grownups have such a tough time following instructions. Mm -hmm. And so we were feeding off of that and thinking, you know, we really, just like we're on this podcast with you, we could walk anyone through this and they could pause us and rewind us and listen to it again. So we just sweated it out and refined what we did to such a degree that we feel like anyone at any educational level could sit through over the course of a weekend. It's 90 minutes, an hour and a half, right? Like movies are longer oh, than video. that. A video's broken up seven minutes, 10 minutes, 17 minutes, five minutes, nine minutes, and all the PDFs and all the extra material and the audios where they could immerse themselves and they could go call someone into the light instead of calling them out, which is what they want to do because something's amiss. Yeah. And so, yeah, so we put that course together and it's up on the Thinkific platform. And you can get, you can get to it through our website or careofmentations.com website. So, you know, the, the goal here is to, you know, we're not giving it away for free, but it's pretty reduced right now because of COVID. We, we had it originally out for like $1,500 and it's like, well, People are losing jobs. It's it's a tough time financially for people. We've already spent the money. You know, it'll be there for as long as we want to keep it up. So right now it's only three hundred dollars for someone to purchase it. Where you know if they had us, like we came out to New York with travel expenses and everything, a person could easily drop eight eight grand for for our services to do an intervention. And so this is such a you know uh, it's such a great offer really for those who can't afford. Um, you know, a, a professional to come out and, and it, you can have breakthrough. So, so the other thing that I just want to drop in there is, is that I wish people, although I know that because our method, we're using it primarily when people are in really dire straits, mm -hmm. but I wish people would think of it as an early yeah. strategy. Like, why do you wait till they've had another seizure and they're in the ER? I mean, that's okay. I mean, we'll do it then. It's going to work. I mean, right? But, but early on where it's low key and so it's rare, but every year we get a couple of cases where it's like, oh yeah, we just want to do a soft intervention. And it's like, oh, our method is so good with that where you're not throwing down hard boundaries and needing to have all this, you know, Threat. leverage, yeah. leverage. Um, so I wish I could change the worldwide paradigm, the idea that it's this is what you do when someone's about to be on death's doorstep. And, and, and also, too, you know, our method, when we do it through them, I mean, nine out of 10 times people say yes to help. Nine out of 10 times. And they're the worst of the worst cases you could imagine. I mean, they're just like, you would look at it and go, there's no way this person is let alone going to sit and let, let you read them letters, but also say, okay, I'll go get help which shows you the power of love and unity mm -hmm. and, and a strategy and calling them in versus out. So even if it was half as good as that on your own, it's still worth trying because our system, it's a remedy for guilt, not necessarily for grief. And, and to have someone know they've done everything they can do in the best way it can be done to have their loved one help themselves. Well, that's a good day, regardless of what they decide to do or not do. And so that's where, you know, we're pretty passionate about that. Uh, so what has been the most fulfilling aspect of your work? And it's for both of you. So mm. 
you, you know, it's, to, to me, it's not just a one, a one answer to that question. So what comes to my mind initially, of course, is when someone says yes, you know, just the elation, the, the, the relief that families feel, the joy that I feel knowing that they're just like so relieved is just priceless. I love that. So conversely, you know, if they say no, it's like uh, painful, but you know, we, we've learned to trust the process. We believe in it. And then the last piece to, to my response is when someone calls me uh, 15 years later and says, I just want you to know that you saved my life. I now have my master's I'm counseling, or I want to do that, or, you know, I'm married, I've got kids. And, you know, just, that is like goosebump moments. And we've had about once a month, we get those kinds of callbacks and, and reports. So that's my response. So for me, the most fulfilling thing about what we do this is that I, every day, I, I'm so thankful for that lady that delivered the mail and that, you know, all for the, for whoever it was that paved that road that is smooth for me to drive on. Like, I'm so thankful for all the people on the earth. And, but I'm so thankful that that's not my job because I'm wired to run in the deep water. And so it's that I get to treat every caller who may or may not hire me that I get to treat every family who does hire us like relatives. And so if I'm intervening on your sister, she's like a niece to me. If I'm intervening on your mother, she's like a sister to me. And, and so I take it personal. So I am going to take this, I'm going to, I can't push because that's unethical, but I'm gonna press because my sister's life depends upon it. And so I don't think there's very many people who even want that kind of capacity to you know, feel that deeply and, and put out that much and then by comparison, be drained that much in how much it demands of us. And I feel, I feel sorry, I feel so sorry for um, people who were wired to love and connect deeply and don't find an outlet for it, whether it's what they do for a living or how they let their guard down in a friendship circle. But I'm most thankful for that, that we run in very deep water. Yeah. So how do you guys do self-care? Like, what do you do? Because I mean, I know that this has to, you know, be heavy work, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you take care of yourself mentally and physically? That's, that's a, such an important question because uh, there's a lot of people who, who want to do this and they'll burn out if it's not their mantle. So first and foremost, it is our mantle. It is our calling. So we know that to be true. And uh, I know our faith is super important. So we've learned to let go of the outcome. So we don't pat ourselves on the back when someone goes and we don't beat ourselves up if they don't go. Uh, from a practical standpoint, I work out almost every single day, maybe take one day off a week for about an hour, you know, that's about all I'll do hour, hour and a half, but I, I, it's an intense workout. So I really push myself. Golf is another important piece. Um, we staff every case. So we're, you know, we talk every day, you know, we're apart. I mean, we're, we're, we're apart sometimes half of the month. And, and so, um, it's fun coming home. It's fun talking on the phone. Again, it, it's that relational piece is super important. So that's part of self-care. I, I, I really believe that. So that's, that's how I take care of me. Golf is a big one for me. I keep a couple sets of clubs in different locations in the country so I don't have to lug my clubs around and go play. <laughs> and I like to golf with him because I because they came out with like hot pink and bright orange and bright yellow balls. <laughs> I wasn't as excited about it with the little white balls, but yeah, golf's come a long way and the clothes have gotten cuter that you can golf in. Yeah. Um, but I'm a fair weather golfer, so I only want to golf if it's going to be 72 degrees, like not too hot, not too cold. But my self-care, my number one self-care is, is that I'm a lifelong learner. And so I am a reader. So there's not a day that goes by that I'm not either listening to an audiobook or studying something. And so that takes my mind out of all those stories, you know, that I'm helping people through their, their, their stuff. And, and my mind is just completely on this other station, so to speak. So that would include listening to your podcast, right? I'm just like totally, I'm all in, I'm all ears. I'm, I'm just soaking it up. And so that's, that's my number one way. Massage too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, massages. <laughs> hey, good. I'm glad to hear that you guys are doing those things. So tell me the areas that you struggle in with this work. 
Um, I, I'd say for me, it's a it's a forced effort to be patient. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm still in that immediate gratification mode. I like things to get done and get done quickly and efficiently. So I struggle when people aren't efficient and they take longer than I think they ought to take. Um, that's probably my number one, you know, struggle. Other than that, I think I'm, 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 I'm pretty good in most all areas other than that. The struggle has diminished for me in the 33 years. So initially the, um, the work would bubble up and then there'd be a big gap and then it would bubble up and then there'd be a big gap. And I, and I wasn't good at writing that kind of erratic rhythm out. So I don't want three weeks off and then to work 10 days straight. So I would have, I, I was resisting. And so once I got into the flow of it, um, I feel like I really don't struggle. That's such an interesting question. I take it when it's coming and my and my adrenaline rises up and I, you know, I can, because sometimes a 15 or 16 hour day is required of us. And so I am thankful that I don't have to work five of those back to back. It'd be one and maybe nine hours the day before, and, but, but only six hours on the days before that. So I've learned to trust that, you know, God's not going to throw me over the side of the cliff mm -hmm. and I can just keep moving mm -hmm. okay rise up to the occasion so if you had to give parents one tip or something that they should look out for you know as we're raising kids and our kids go through these ups and downs what is something that we should really pay attention to to to, to um be on alert that there may be an issue or something brewing that could lead to you know drug leading us <laughs> <laughs> yeah, needing you guys. Well, the first thing that came to my mind was to trust your heart. If, if, if you're sensing something's up, if the alarm is going in your heart, it's important to not squelch that or, or write it off as just, oh, they're immature, it's a phase, that kind of a thing. That's good. Uh, so to be able to, to act upon that. So whether it's reach out to somebody to share what you're sensing or what you're seeing or what you're thinking. Uh, or, or to inquire on your own, knowing that most, most kids will tell their parents what they think they wanna hear. They're afraid to be judged. They're afraid to let you down. Uh, they're afraid, fear. And so again, it's how you approach it. You know, do you have a strategy? How do you speak that effectively that allows them to be open to whatever they're going through, which ultimately they would feel relieved if they spoke their truth. And so, that's what we see over and over again is, is parents, when we throw out, we throw out, you know, is, is there anything you feel guilty about? Anything that you regret? And always it's, I wished I would have done something sooner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather be, I'd, I'd rather err on the side of caution and be wrong than not do anything and be right. Yeah. That's good, Scott. Yeah. It's good advice. So I know that both went off the rails as teenagers, and even be, for me, even before, I'm a, I was the only elementary school child who smoked during recess in the bathroom, <laughs> and so I stayed, you know, then, you know, cigarettes, they really are a gateway drug, um, but I would, I would have the piece of advice of, of parents carving out time when you are eye to eye. And so no electronics at the table, make sure you're getting a couple of meals where you're breaking bread and having conversation. Um, prior to me taking up smoking, we used to take family walks after dinner. And, and so just anything you can do that's, that's gonna be the opposite of the isolation and disassociation and distraction and busyness mm -hmm. uh, to, and that way the door is open because it's easier to bring I, I have unrest in my heart. Or I'm concerned about this. You know, let's talk. It's easier to do that when you actually are in a relationship where that's not so strange. That you can yeah, talk. that's great advice. Yes, my daughter loves game night. We used to do game night, but then I've gotten so busy with all my side hustles <laughs> that I haven't been able to do game night, but I think I'm going to bring that back. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> Good. So it seems like you guys are living a purpose-driven life. So I'm going to ask, do you feel like you are doing purpose-driven work? Oh, 100%. We, we absolutely feel like we're a front for a ministry. 
uh, that, um, you know, we don't evangelize when we're doing work because we work with people who are not believers, people who are, it doesn't matter to us where you're at in that respect. But in the backdrop, we are praying and contending for every intervention that we do. We have a team of people who contend for, you know, the people we're, we're, we're working with mm -hmm. and, and for the success of that. Um, and, and, and so you better believe it. 100% purpose-driven kingdom building. Uh, we're trying to help people realize why were they created to be on this earth? It, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't to suck alcohol down your body or to be anxious or depressed. It was to do something and, and we want to help you find it. So definitely. I love that. Yeah. So, all right, guys, it's time for you to share an oh hell no moment that has changed your life for better or worse. It could be a bad moment. It could be a moment that made you realize something and change things, or it could be a moment that was exciting and good. Mm -hmm. So whoever wants to start first. I think, I think my um, oh hell no moment was oh hell no, we aren't gonna wait. So Scott proposed to me after 11 days and um, we planned a wedding that was going to be way far out, like, you know, a year away, way, way down the road. I want to wait and see if the guy ends up doing time, you know, like, I want to play this out like a card game, figure out. And uh, <laughs> literally a few days later, he said to me, we we're having pie and coffee in a coffee shop. And he goes, he just paused. I still can see the pie on his fork. And he looks at me and he says, you know, I'd marry you tomorrow. And I looked at him and that was like, oh, hell no, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. I said, I'm busy, but I can fit it in on Friday. So literally <laughs> four days later, we're eloping. We're, you know, running off to Las Vegas to the little chapel on the strip and saying I do. And so that was my moment. That, that moment changed my life. Wow. I love that story. <laughs> I'll tell you what, mine, mine, mine's, mine's a pretty personal one. Uh -oh. And, and it, was, it was me repeating some of my past with Jenny. And she said to me, I need you to leave. And I said, oh, hell no, I'm staying. And we're going to work this out. And I'm glad that I did, and she did. Nice, Scott. Good for you. See, you didn't want to lose Jenny. She's a good catch. <laughs> oh, boy. I, 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 they say, you know, you, 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 I married up and, you know, I, I outkicked my coverage and, and, and all of that is true. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely know I've got a, a gem in Jenny. Oh, you guys are fabulous. I love it. So please tell everyone where they can connect with you, find out about your books, your courses, whatever you have going on. Please share. All right. Well, we have a toll-free number for starters, and it's 844-588-3267. 3267. Yeah, yeah. So 844-588-3267. And our website is carefrontations.com. And so it's a made-up word. Uh, so instead of confrontations, it's carefrontations. So C-A-R-E, like I care about you. F-R-O-N-T, like the front door. And A-T-I-O-N-S dot com. And, and that has a link to the course and every we keep that up to date with anything we've got going on. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, guys. 